أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The topic of the awaited Savior, the 12th Imam, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, is a very important topic that concerns every single one of us. And thus, we should all strive in educating ourselves about this awaited Savior. Now, why, you might ask, why is this topic so important? A few reasons. Number one, you find that every single human being in this world today, they dream and hope for a day in which all the tyranny and the corruption and the aggression and oppression and evil that exists in this world, they hope and dream that one day all of this will come to an end. And one day the world will be filled with justice and peace. Every human being has hope that one day all human beings can be treated with dignity and respect. Now yes, maybe some human beings, they may believe that this will remain as a dream for eternity and it will never realize. But they are a minority. Because the majority of human beings believe that no, a day will come in which things will change. Corruption, evil, tyranny will come to an end and the world will be filled with justice. And that will be upheld and established at the hands of a messianic figure. That messianic figure will rise and he will do, he will spread the, the justice and, and, the, and the peace that every human being is looking for. Look at Muslims, look at Jews, look at Christians, look at Zoroastrians, look at Hindus and Buddhists. The followers of all these religions, they all believe in a messianic figure that will bring justice to this world. Now we may differ on the name, but the notion we all agree on. So humanity has had enough of this bloodshed. They're tired, they're sick of this bloodshed and this tyranny that exists. And they are all looking for that day in which that messianic figure, that Messiah will come and put an end to this. So this is why, the first reason why this is an important topic, because every human being is waiting for that day in which that Messiah comes and brings the justice. That's number one. Number two, we the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we have even more reasons to be concerned about the 12th Imam or the awaited Savior. Why? Because we believe as being the followers of Ahlul Bayt, that Imam Al-Mahdi Allahu Farajahu Sharif, he is the Imam of our time. He is our leader. We are the Shia of Imam Mahdi. And how difficult it is for us, the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, to be disunited, to be far from our Imams. We living in the, the period of al ghayba we cannot see our Imam. We cannot benefit from the Imam. What an honor it is for a person just to see the beautiful face of the Imam. When I take that beautiful look at the, the face of the Imam and it's illuminating with Iman. Do you know what a beautiful effect that has on the human being? How it softens his heart. Just a look, just one look if I see the Imam how it softens my heart, how it takes me closer, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how it makes my iman stronger. But we living in this period of al-ghaybah, we have been denied this honor. We cannot see our imam. We cannot benefit from our imam. We cannot benefit from his knowledge, from his wisdom, from his guidance. And that's why every single one of us here, we wait for that day in which we can finally see our imam. Finally benefit from our Imam. Finally we could be alongside him and become one of his companions and sacrifice our lives just like the followers and the companions of Imam Hussein sacrifice their lives for Imam Hussein. What do we say? Don't we say, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum? We wish we were with you. We wish we were with them and that we wish we can be with Imam al-Mahdi and we could support Imam al-Mahdi. 
our Imam is the most precious thing that we have in our lives. This is one of the qualities of a Shia. He loves the Imam more than his children, more than anyone in this world. So how hard is it difficult to live your entire life and you do not see your Imam even once? So every single one of us wants to see that day. Wants to see that day that we can see the Imam. We can be with him. Become one of his supporters and companions and friends. And that's why many of us we ask, when will the Imam finally reappear? When can we finally have that honor and blessing of seeing the Imam? Of being with the Imam? How can I prepare for the Imam? And how can I become one of the companions of the Imam when he does reappear? How many of us think about these things? Because the Imam is very dear to our heart. And we are in a state of distress in the ghaybah. Because we do not have our leader with us. We do not have the Imam to guide us and be with us. Do we not read every night in Dua Al-Iftitah that we will inshallah read tonight? Do we not read in it every night? Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareemah. تُعِزُّ بِهَا الْإِسْلَامَ وَأَهْلَهِ وَتُذِلُّ بِهَا النِّفَاقَ وَأَهْلَهِ Do we not read where the Imam, he says, the Dua Al-Iftitah, it's narrated from Imam Al-Mahdi himself, عَجَّلَ اللَّهِ فَرَجَهُ الشَّرِيفِ Every believer says this in Dua Al-Iftitah, Ya Allah, we wait and yearn for that day in which the government of Imam Al-Mahdi will come, دَوْلَةٍ كَرِيمَةٍ In which we the believers, we will have our dignity and might back and honor and respect and the enemies of Allah, they will be, the enemies of Allah, they will be weak on that day. And you will give us our dignity and we will see peace and justice filling the world. This is one of the wishes of every single believer in the school of thoughts of Ahlul Bayt So this is number two. This is an area of concern because we in the state of Ghayba, we are lost from our Imam. We are lost without our Imam. And we wait every second, every hour that passes by, we wait for that day in which we can finally be reunited with our Imam. So this is number two. Number three, why the belief in the Imam is a very important aspect. And why this is a very important topic that concerns all of us, is that you find that the belief in the Imam, Imam al-Mahdi, is a pillar in the belief of every Muslim. Every Muslim has to believe in Imam al-Mahdi. It is wajib, incumbent, necessary, mandatory upon every Muslim to believe that al-Mahdi will come. Now the only difference between we, the followers of Ahl-Bayt, the Shia, and the rest of the schools of thought, and we'll speak more about this later on, is that we believe he was born, but they believe he will be born. But we both, we all agree, every Muslim believes that Imam al-Mahdi will come one day. And he will, he will fulfill this task, fill the world with justice. And this belief is wajib. If I'm a Muslim, I have to believe in Imam al-Mahdi. And that's why the famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَّ This is a hadith that all the Muslims accept and narrate. Whoever dies, he does not know the Imam of his time. Or in some other hadith, مَنْ مَاتَ بِغَيْرِ إِمَامِ or مَنْ مَاتَ مِنْ غَيْرِ بَيْعَةٍ لِإِمَامِهِ They're all different terms but the same meaning. Whoever dies not knowing his Imam of his time, whoever dies not giving the bay'ah to the Imam of his time, the allegiance to the Imam of his time, the Prophet says this person has died a death of jahiliyyah before Rasulullah. Meaning this person has died a death of ignorance, he's not a Muslim. You're not even a true Muslim if you do not know who the Imam of your time is. You're not a true Muslim. This is the hadith that all of them accept. Who is the Imam of our time? Who is it other than Imam al-Mahdi? And that's why it's narrated in history that Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalifa, he came one day to Al-Kufa and he came to the palace of Al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj, he was the governor of Al-Kufa and he was a very ruthless vicious governor. He used to kill so many people, especially the followers of Ahlul Bayt. So he comes one night, it's at night, usually you do not see the governor at night, you wait during the, you know, the work hours, during the day. So he comes at night, he says it's, it's urgent. He's the son of the previous Khalifa, so they, they let him in. Hajjad tells him, what's going on? Why have you come at this time? He said, I have come to give you my bay'ah. He tells him, why now? Why couldn't I wait till tomorrow? He said, no, I am afraid that if it waited till tomorrow, I may have died. And I would have died without sabay'ah of an imam, 
I would have died without knowing my Imam. So I have come to give you my bay'ah right now. Al Hajjaj he belittled him. He was like this guy's not very not very, you know, normal. So he told him, you know what, I'm busy right now. Usually when you want to give bay'ah, the leader, the Imam, whoever that was, he would take out his hand and then you would wipe your hand on his hand, and this was considered the bay'ah. So Al Hajjaj he said, I'm busy right now, I can't lend you my hand. What did he do? He took out his foot. He gave him his foot, he told him, give bay'ah to my foot. So he's mocking him, he's belittling littling him like he's a little kid. So he says, do bay'ah of my foot. And I've heard some reports, they say, that Al-Hajjaj was eating, he was busy eating, and his hand was oily. So he did not want to give bay'ah with his hand, he put out his leg, and Abdullah ibn Umar, he gave bay'ah to the leg of Al-Hajjaj. And by the way, the same man, Abdullah ibn Umar, they say that when Imam Ali alayhi salam became the Khalifa, he resisted giving the bay'ah because he thought the bay'ah of Imam Ali was there was something wrong with it, something, there was a fault and he was not the rightful khalifa. He refrained from giving bay'ah to Imam Ali but he then gave bay'ah to Hajjaj many years later. SubhanAllah, you see the contradictions. So anyway, all the Muslims they accept that if I die without the bay'ah of my Imam, without knowing my Imam of my time, then I have died not Muslim, death of Jahiliyyah. So that's why it's important for me to know who the Imam of my time is. There's a hadith narrated by Zurara, one of the closest companions of Imam al-Sadiq He says that one day Imam al-Sadiq told me, Ya Zurara, if you lived until you saw the Mahdi. Now the Imam knew Zurara won't live because Zurara lived maybe 100, 150 years before Imam Mahdi. But this is a hadith so that the Shia that will come later will hear. If you lived until the day that the 12th Imam Al-Mahdi will come and you will live in the time of his ghaybah. Imam al-Sadiq told Zurara about the ghaybah of the 12th Imam 100, 100 years before it happened. He told him, if you live up to that time, then do not forget about this dua. There is an important dua that we have to always read in Zaman al-Ghaybah. In the occultation of the Imam that we are living in Zaman al-Ghaybah. What's that dua? The Imam tells Zurara, Ya Zurara, if you ever come across the time of the ghaybah, and then read this dua. Say, Allahumma arrifni nafsak. Fa innaka in lam tu'arrifni nafsak, lam a'rif nabiyak. Ya Allah, I ask you to help me in knowing you. Because if I don't know you, Ya Allah, I will not know your messenger. If you don't know Allah, how will you know his messenger? And then say this, Allahumma arrifni nabiyak, aw rasulak. Fa innaka in lam tu'arrifni nabiyak, lam a'rif hujjatak. Ya Allah. I ask you to help me in knowing who the Prophet is, who the Messenger is. Because if I do not know who the Messenger is, how will I know who the successor of the Messenger is, who the Imam of my time is? If I do not know Rasulullah, of course I will not know the Imams because Rasulullah is the one that appointed the Imams by the order of Allah. So if I don't know Rasulullah, I will not know the Imams either. And then and this is the cornerstone of the dua. This is the main line of the dua. He says, Allahumma arrifni hujjatak fa innaka in lam tu'arrifni hujjatak dhalaltu an deeni. Ya Allah, I ask you to help me in knowing the Imam of my time, the hujjah, the proof of Allah on this planet. Because if you do not help me in knowing who the Imam is, dhalaltu an deeni. I will deviate from my faith. I'll go astray. My faith will be incomplete. So this is a dua that we always have to read in Zaman al ghaybah so that as if I want to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to be close to the Imam of my time. So this is number three. The belief in Imam al-Mahdi is an important belief that every Muslim should believe in. Now, as I said, the only difference is that we say he's, he was born, they say he will be born, and I'll speak a little more about that in a few minutes. So this is number three, point number three. And then we come to point number four. The fourth reason why the belief and the 12th Imam and the awaited Savior is very important. We have numerous ahadith from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt all saying this point. That if I pray to Allah and I fast and I go to Hajj and I do so many good deeds, but however, I do not know the Imam of my time or I do not accept the Imam of my time, I do not pay my bay'ah, my allegiance to the Imam of my time, Allah will not reward me for any amal that I do. Numerous ahadith, not just one or two, many ahadith, an entire chapter you'll find about this in the books of ahadith. 
And that's why it's narrated that one day, this happened during the time of Prophet Isa, Jesus, that there was a man, the hadith says, he prayed for 40 days with his family, and they had hajat. All of them, they got what they wanted except him. Why am I not getting my hajat? Why is Allah not answering my prayers? So he went to Prophet Isa, what's wrong? Why is my dua not being answered? Isa, he asked Allah, Allah tells him, tell that person that he has been praying and doing dua and supplicating to me while he has doubt in his heart about my messenger, about Isa. As long as you have doubts about my messenger, I don't care how many salah you do. I don't care how many good deeds you did. First, you have to what? You have to believe in the messenger and then the hujjah of Allah and then come and do the ibadat because the, the, the belief in the imam is the pillar. Those are the details. So if you do not have conviction in the imam, Allah will not accept the a'mal. So this man, he said, okay, I believe in Isa and only then Allah accepted his, his deeds. And numerous ahadith, like I said, the Imams tell us, if I do not have the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt, I do not know the Imam of my time, I do not accept the wilaya of the Imam of my time, Allah says, I don't want this. Listen to this hadith, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, لو أن رجلا قام ليلة وصام نهارة وحج دهره وتصدق بجميع أمواله ولم يعرف ولاية ولي الله في واليه ولم يعمل بجميع أعماله بدلالته إليه لم يكن له على الله حق في ثوابه If any human being, the Imam says, every night he spends it from the beginning of the night till Fajr صلاة 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 الليل صلاة مستحب And every day he fasts We only fast 30 days out of the year Imagine if someone fasts the entire year Take the two days of Eid out that you can't fast Eid al-Fitr and Adha All the other days of the year he fasts and in, a, in addition to that, all his money he gives it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the poor, for Usainiyah, for anything that, that's for the cause of Allah. And he goes to Hajj every single year. But however, the Imam says, but he does not know the Imam of his time. He does not have the wilaya of the Imam of his time. He does not accept the wilaya of the Imam of his time. Then this person, the Imam says, he will not receive any reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing. Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَىٰ مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ أَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا So many people in this world, they spend their entire lives ibadah. They think they have a mountain of reward. The Holy Quran says on the Day of Judgment, we will come and we will destroy all their ibadah. Nothing. فَجَعَلْنَاهُ أَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We will make it into ash, into nothing, into dust. Because where is the imamah that I asked you? First bring the imamah and then bring the a'mal. We said the imamah is the pillar. It's the pillar. Can you, have a, can you have a building, a structure without the pillar? It's like you keep on building, you keep on adding floors on a building that does not have pillars, that does not have the correct pillars. It's all gonna what? It's all gonna get destroyed and fall down. And number two, you might ask, why doesn't Allah give me the reward? Number two, if you do not accept the imam of your time or the imams of Ahlul Bayt, how do you know your a'mal are sahih? How do you know your salah is the correct way? How do you know that your hajj is the correct way? Imam al-Sadiq says salah, hajj, khumuz, zakat is this way. Abu Hanifa, Malik, the other ones, they say it's in a different way. So if you do not follow Imam al-Sadiq and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, how do you know you're doing your a'mal the correct way? Maybe you're doing all these a'mal the wrong way. So if you want to make sure you're doing what Allah wants, follow the Imam. Because he is the one that has the knowledge of Rasulullah, not the others. It is the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, And that's why the belief in Imam al-Mahdi is so important. May God forbid that I am resurrected on the Day of Judgment and I see all my life, I did so many good deeds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not accept any of them because there was a fault in my aqidah, in my conviction. I did not believe in the 12th Imam or in the one, any, any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, or I had doubt in my heart for them. Allah says, you want me to reward you? You have to believe in the Imam. So these are the reasons why this topic of Imam al-Mahdi Allahu farajahu sharif is a very important topic. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And because the Imam is the Imam of our time, he is the Imam of this period, of me, of me, of my father, of my grandchildren, of my children, my great-grandfather. 
And because this topic is so sensitive and so important and has a huge effect on our ibadat, on our faith, on our iman, inshallah for the next few nights I will go over the topic of Imam al-Mahdi. Inshallah we can touch up upon the different aspects of Imam al-Mahdi, ajrallahu farajahu sharif And because you see that this topic of Imam al-Mahdi is so important, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not forget to mention the Imam in the Qur'an. Imam al-Mahdi is mentioned in the Qur'an numerous times. How many times? Some ulama <coughs> have counted the verses that speak about Imam al-Mahdi up to 130 verses. Up to 130 verses in the Qur'an speaking about Imam al-Mahdi. Now, don't go open the Qur'an tonight and look for the word Mahdi. This is not mentioned in the Qur'an because Mahdi is not even the name of the Imam. Mahdi is one of the titles, one of the nicknames of the Imam. The name of the Imam is the same as the name of Rasulullah. So that's his name. But when we say the Imam is mentioned, we mean Allah refers to him. And Allah speaks about the government that will come at the end of time and that will bring justice and peace and will get rid of all tyranny. Allah has mentioned this in the Quran 130 times. Now you may ask, why didn't Allah just mention his name directly in the Quran? For the same reason why Allah didn't directly mention the name of Imam Ali. We need to give an entire lecture to, to explain why didn't Allah say directly in the Quran, Ali ibn Abi Talib is the successor of Rasulullah. There are, there's many reasons. And this question was, was posed to Imam al-Sadiq thousand years ago. One of, one of the companions, he asked Imam al-Sadiq, that the, you know, the Muslims, the non-Shia Muslims, they say, why isn't Ali mentioned in the Qur'an? If you say Imam is so important and Imam Ali is this and that, so why didn't Allah mention the Imam Ali in the Qur'an? The Imam gives a beautiful answer. There's many answers, but in this hadith, he gives a beautiful answer. He tells him, go tell these Muslims, do you not say that Salah is the most important wajib? You believe, you see the Sunnis, they pray, pray, pray the whole day. Salah is the most important thing to them. So you say salah, and we also, we narrate the hadith from Rasulullah where he says, as salah to amudu deen Salah is the pillar of faith. So go and tell them, Allah, you, you say that salah is the most important thing in faith. Now, where in the Quran, show me, does Allah say that salah to subuh is two rak'ahs? Where in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that salah to dhuhr is four rak'ahs? And subhanAllah, just... To yesterday on my flight when I was coming here I was sitting next to someone who subhanallah by chance we, it was a Muslim Shia and we spoke about some topics and we spoke about Imam al-Mahdi and I saw this person doesn't even believe in Imam al-Mahdi and he's a Shia and he's, he's, he has a beard he prays everything but he has doubts about Imam al-Mahdi so I had to give him the same analogy I told him that where in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that Salatul salat Dhuhr is... I told him Imam al-Mahdi's name, everything is mentioned in the hadith, but the Quran refers to him. He says, no, no, we don't need that hadith. I told him if you don't need that hadith, how do you know how to pray? Who told you Salatul Dhuhr is four rak'ah? Maybe it's three rak'ah. Maybe it's not mentioned in the Quran. Yes, Salah is mentioned in the Quran. As a general point, principle, Salah is mentioned. But the details, you get it from the Sunnah of Rasulullah and from Ahlul Bayt. Likewise, Imama is mentioned in the Quran in many verses in the Quran. But the details, the names, you get that from the Sunnah of Rasulullah. So Imam al-Mahdi is referred to 130 verses at least in the Quran. Now sometimes he's referred to in the tafsir and other times in the ta'wil. What do we mean? When we want to understand the Quran, they say there's always two stages. Number one, there's the tafsir. Tafsir is the apparent meaning that most of us understand. And then there's a second stage, a deeper stage for the believers, for those that have knowledge. And this is called ta'wil. Ta'wil is the hidden meaning. And this hidden meaning, we can only get it from Ahlul Bayt Almost every verse in the Quran has an apparent meaning, and then it has a hidden meaning. Many of these verses, the ta'wil of these verses is about Imam al-Mahdi sharif And I'll give you some examples. I'll mention you five verses. But first, sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The first verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Imam al-Mahdi in the Qur'an, the verse that I began my lecture with, Allah says in the Holy Qur'an, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ Allah says in the Holy Qur'an, and we want to bestow a favor upon those that were weak, or those that the human beings deemed them as being weak. They're not necessarily weak, but human beings saw them as weak. We want to bestow upon them a favor. What favor? Allah says, we want to make them what? 
نجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم وارثين. We want to make them imams. We want to make them rulers. And we want to make them وارثين inheritors. What do they inherit? They inherit the entire world. The entire world will be at their hands. Who is this verse speaking about? Our ahadith indicate that when our 12th imam was born, and he was only maybe a few minutes old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave him the ability to speak and he spoke. He read this verse. He said, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ And then he said, this is me. Allah is speaking about me, Imam Al-Mahdi. Just like Allah gave Prophet Isa the ability to speak while he was a baby in his cradle, he gave Imam Al-Mahdi that ability. So our ahadith all indicate that this verse is speaking about the 12th Imam. This is the first verse. The second verse that speaks about the 12th Imam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا يُبَدْ وَلَا يَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا Allah says that Allah has promised you amongst you the ones that believe and do good deeds what what has Allah promised us that I will make amongst you khulafa just like I made Khulafa before you. Khulafa means the leaders. And then Allah says, and I will make their religion prevail over all the religions. And I will give them security and I'll give them safety so that they no longer have to live in fear. Our ahadith all say this is speaking about Imam al-Mahdi. And we read in Dua al-Iftitah likewise every night. We read about this. Dua al-Iftitah, we reach a point in which we begin to mention the name of Rasulullah, Imam Ali, one, every Imam after the other. And then we mention the 12th Imam. After we mention the 12th Imam in Dua Al-Iftitah, what do we say? Allahumma ja'alhu da'ya ila kitabik. And then, who's memorized Dua Al-Iftitah? Well, wal-qa'ima bidinik. And then what do we say? Istakhlifhu fil ard, kama istakhlifta al-ladheena min qablih. مكن له دينه الذي ارتضيته له أبدله من بعد أمنه خوفا يعبدك لا يشرك the same verse that we read Imam Al Mahdi he applies this to himself because we said Dua Al Fatah is narrated by Imam Al Mahdi so we read the Dua we say Ya Allah we ask you to make the Imam the Khalifa that you promised in what the Khalifa meaning what the ruler the apparent Khalifa that you promised in the Quran and make his religion prevail over the religions so this is the Second verse that speaks about the Imam. The third verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Imam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Allah says that He is the one, Allah is the one that sent His Messenger, our Prophet. He sent him as a guidance and he sent him with a true religion so that his religion would prevail over all the religions. Now, I ask you, during the life of Rasulullah, Imam Ali, and up to today, since the beginning of Islam till now, was Islam able to reach a state in which it basically ruled the entire world? Never. Even during the time of Rasulullah, even at the height of the Khilafah of the Muslims, whether you look at it at the time of Bani al-Abbas, the time of Harun, or whether you look at the, for example, the Uthmanis, the Ottoman Empire, when they were the most powerful country, they were not the country or the, or the empire that ruled the entire world. Europe you had, you had India, and you had Asia, and you had Southern Africa. This was not in their control. And obviously this part, North America, which wasn't even uh, discovered, or it had inhabitants, but the point is, Islam didn't reach here. So the Qur'an is saying a time will come, Allah sent Rasulullah, so that a day will come in which Islam will become the overwhelming religion throughout the globe. Our Imams tell us that the ta'wil of this verse, this verse will only apply when our 12th Imam reappears. And only then the entire world will become Muslim. And I'll speak more about that a different night, inshallah, how this will happen exactly. The hadith tell us that every land in this world will call La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Every land in the world will be what? Will be in the hands of Imam al-Mahdi. So this is what? This is the third verse that speaks about the 12th Imam. The fourth verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the 12th Imam, about the awaited Savior, Imam al-Mahdi, Ajal Allah, Farajah sharif Allah says in the Quran, Baqiyatullahi khayrun lakum. In kuntum mu'mineen. He says, Baqiyatullah. 
How many times have we heard Baqiyatullah? Assalamu alayka ya Baqiyatullah. What is Baqiyatullah? Baqiyatullah, my dear brothers and sisters, is the name of the Imam. It's one of the titles of the Imam. One of the companions, he asked the Imam, if we see the Imam, how do we say salam to him? The Imam says, say assalamu alayka ya Baqiyatullah. Just like Amir al Mu'mineen, his title is Amir al Mu'mineen. The title of our 12th Imam is Baqiyatullah. What is Baqiyatullah? Baqiyah means what remains, the remnant of Allah. So basically, Allah says in the Holy Quran that what I have placed for you and saved for you as a remnant is much better for you if you are Mu'mineen. The ahadith tell us that Baqiyatullah is our 12th Imam. He is what Allah has saved for us because he's in the occultation now in the ghaybah. So he's saving the Imam until the day that he will rise insha'Allah. And in a story I'll mention later, I'll quickly mention it right now. One of the companions of Imam al-Askari, the 11th Imam, by the name of Ahmed ibn Ishaq. He's very, he's very well known. And the Imam, Imam al-Askari, he ordered Ahmed ibn Ishaq to build a masjid in Qom. He lived in Qom, the city of Qom in Iran during the time of Imam Askari. And the masjid still exists. It's, it's called Masjid Imam al-Hassan al-Askari. He built it over a thousand years ago, Ahmad ibn Ishaq, by the order of Imam al-Askari. And he was one of the closest companions of the 11th Imam. Now, when the, when the 12th Imam was born, I'll speak about this tomorrow, there was lots of confusion about his birth. I'll speak more about that tomorrow. Ahmad ibn Ishaq, he says, I left Qom, I went to Samarra. I asked the Imam, the 11th Imam, I want to see your son. He showed me the Imam, he was a young baby. And then he told the Imam, I want to see a sign, a miracle at the hands of this. Because they knew that they, if, I, if I want to follow a new Imam, there has to be a miracle to show me that this is the new Imam. So as soon as he told Imam al-Askari, I want to see a sign, Ahmed ibn Ishaq, he says, I see this little baby, he began to speak. He told him, Ya Ahmed, ana baqiyatullah. I am what Allah has saved. So do not have any doubt in me after this. He says, I left and I was very happy about this. So this is the fourth verse. Baqiyatullah is our 12th Imam. And finally, the fifth verse that I'll mention, there's much more verses, but I'll only mention this verse. The fifth verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about our 12th Imam in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ Allah says, and we wrote in the Zabur, the Psalms of David, what did we write in the Psalms of David in the Zabur? That the righteous ones, the good believers, they will inherit the world. They will rule the world. A day will come in which they will rule the entire world. Subhanallah. Go open the Bible today. We say the Bible, lots of it is distorted, it's changed. But go open the Bible today. The Old Testament. Go open the Psalms of David, it's available. Go to chapter 37, I saw it. Verse 9, it says, And those that, ho that have hope in the Lord, they will inherit the world. So that same verse Allah is mentioning in the Quran, Allah says that we wrote in the Zabur, it's still protected, it's still in the Psalms, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the righteous ones will inherit the world, it's still in the Bible. So these are five verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about the 12th Imam in the Quran, and like I said, there's many verses. And if you want to read about all these verses, there are books written about the verses of Imam al-Mahdi in the Quran, amongst the best of these books, or one of the best of these books is al mahdi fil Quran. You'll type it on Google, you'll, you'll see it online. It's written by uh, Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi. Habbalahullah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So this is the Quran. And then we come to the Sunnah. The Ahadith of Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt. The Ahadith that we have from Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt about Imam Al Mahdi are tremendous, overwhelming. Do you know how many ahadith we, the Shia and the Sunnis all together, how many ahadith we have about Imam Mahdi? Over 6,000 hadiths. How many of those have I read? Five? Ten? Hundred? If I've read 1,000, then that's only one sixth. And I bet most of us, we haven't even read maybe 50 of them. 6,000 hadiths from Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt about Imam Al Mahdi. So much details. Why would they concentrate so much on this topic if it was unimportant? Why waste people's time? What does this show you? It's, a, it's an important topic. Do not belittle it. Do not say, well, what's the importance of Mahdi? If it was not so important, why did the Sunnis narrate hundreds of ahadiths about Imam al-Mahdi? Hundreds upon hundreds of ahadiths they have narrated. And 
There is a book called Al Mu'jam Al Mawdu'i Lil Imam Al Mahdi by Sheikh Al Qurani. It's a beautiful book. He has compiled most or all of those ahadith. It's a very fat book. It's probably as much as four or five volumes, but he's put it all in one volume. Put all those ahadith in a beautiful, organized way in that book. I suggest you all read it. It's also available online. And amongst the ahadith that our Sunni brothers narrate from Rasulullah is this hadith where Rasulullah says, Al Mahdi min Itrati min Wuldi Fatima. The Mahdi that will come at the end of time and bring and bring peace and justice. He is from my progeny. He's from the children of Fatima. You find this hadith, Sunan Abi Dawood narrates it. You find Bukhari. Bukhari narrates it, but unfortunately, he does not narrate it in his book. You see, Bukhari has a few books. The most important book he has is Sahih al-Bukhari, which is the most important Sunni book of hadith. Now in Sahih al-Bukhari, he does not mention this hadith. He does mention Imam al-Mahdi, but he only mentions a hadith that refer to him. There's no name. But this term, al-Mahdi, he narrates it in one of his other books called Tariq al-Bukhari. He has a book called Tariq al-Bukhari. He mentions the history of Islam. And he narrates this hadith where Rasulullah says, al-Mahdi min atrati min waldi Fatima. And there's many, many, many other hadith about Imam al-Mahdi and about so what will happen when the Imam reappears, the sign of reappearance, who his companions are. The Sunnis, they all narrate this. And one of the most important hadith, brothers and sisters, that we use to prove that the Imam, Imam al-Mahdi Sharif, is alive today. Remember we said that most Muslims, they say no. The 12th Imam is not born. He will be born whenever he wants to rise. So if the Imam will rise in a thousand years, he'll be born a few years before that. But we say no, he's the son of Imam al-Askari. He was born a thousand years ago and he's alive right now. One of the most beautiful ways and strongest ways to prove that the Imam is alive till now is through a very well-known hadith that all of you have heard. The hadith is called Hadith al -thiqlain. Hadith al -thiqlain is a hadith that all Muslims accept. What's Hadith al -thiqlain? Hadith al -thiqlain is that on the day of Ghadir Khum, the day of Ghadir, when Rasulullah appointed Imam Ali as the Khalifa. Before he appointed Imam Ali, he gave the sermon. What did he say? He told them, I'm going to die. But I will leave for you two things, two heavy elements. He told them, Two heavy elements. What are those two heavy elements, Ya Rasulullah? Kitab Allah. Number one is the Quran. Obviously, that's number one. That's a book of guidance for you to, to go back to. And then the hadith says, وَعِتْرَتِي أَهْلَ بَيْتِي Some ahadith narrated as عِتْرَتِي. Some ahadith, Ahl Bayti. And then there's a third set of ahadith that narrate it differently. How? Sunnati. You see, many times you'll hear some people, they will say, Rasulullah said, I will leave the book of Allah and Sunnati, my Sunnah. Why? So that there is no name of Ahl Bayt. My ahad, the book of Allah and the ahadith of Rasulullah, Sunnati. There is no Ahl Bayt. And you'll see many, unfortunately, many lecturers in the Islamic world, from the Sunni Islamic world, when they mention Hadith al-Thiqlain, they mention Sunnati, not Ahl Bayti or Itrati. While when you go back to their books, you find the Sahih version, the correct version of this Hadith is Itrati. You see, go back to Sahih Muslim, go Google it tonight, search about it, do your research. Rasulullah didn't say Sunnati in Sahih Muslim when he narrates it. He says, Ahl Bayti, I'm leaving the Book of Allah and my family, even though we accept the Sunnah of Rasulullah, but that's not what he said. He said, the Book of Allah, and my progeny, Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam But unfortunately, they want to what? Some of them, they want to forget about Ahl Bayt, neglect Ahl Bayt, so they say Sunnati. And they themselves, their ulama, they accept, they all admit this, that this hadith, was Sunnati is da'if, it's unauthentic. The correct Sahih version is Itrati Ahl Bayti, is my family and my progeny. So, after Rasulullah said this, that I am leaving the book of Allah, and I am leaving my family. He says, And then he says, As long as you adhere to these two together, Quran and Hadith, you will never go astray. You will be safe. So if there are some people, when they ask you, why is such and such haram? Why is this haram? You tell them, Hadith says it. They tell you, no, no, I want from the Quran. These people are going against the hadith of Rasulullah. Rasulullah says, Quran and Ahl Bayti. You say just Quran? 
Unfortunately, I find this and I gave a lecture about this many times. Some people when they ask you, where does the Quran say music is haram? Where does the Quran say you can't shave your beard for the man? Where does the Quran say you can't? Brother, why are you saying the Quran, the Quran? There's Quran, Rasulullah said, Kitab Allah wa itrati. Ask where in the Quran or in the hadith of Ahl Bayt. When you bring them a hadith of Ahl Bayt, they say, no, no, I don't want this. I want Quran. This is your following whom? The man that said, Hasbuna Kitab Allah. The Quran is enough. Rasulullah said, Quran and Ahl Bayt. That man that came and became the second Khalifa, he said, no, Quran is enough. He rejected Rasulullah's words. So the, the Prophet said, Kitab Allah wa itrati. The, the Quran and the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. As long as you adhere to both of them, you will not go astray. So if you say just Quran, that means you're going astray. You're going the wrong way. And then Rasulullah after that, he says, مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَن تَظِلُّوا بَعْدِ أَبَدًا And then he said, وَإِنَّهُمَا لَيَّفْتَرِقَا حَتَّى يَرِدْهَا عَلَيَّ الْحَوْضِ And this is, this is the important point in this hadith. He said, and these two will never separate until the Day of Judgment. They will never ever separate. What does this hadith prove? This proves that even today, there is an imam, infallible, ma'asum imam that's amongst us. Why? Because our Sunni brothers, they say, Rasulullah died, there was a few good khulafa, they were the hujjahs of Allah. Right now there's no imam of our time, an infallible imam. And then the Mahdi will come whenever, in a thousand years. So you ask them, then who is the khalifa of Allah right now? Who is the imam of Allah? Who is the successor of Rasulullah from the itra right now? Then Rasulullah say, my book and my itra, they will never separate. So is there an imam from the descendants of Rasulullah alive now or no? If they say no, then you, you tell them, then that means they have separated. Quran is alive. Atrat Rasulullah is dead. They have separated, correct? The Prophet says they will never separate. As long as the Quran is alive, there has to be an imam from the itra of Rasulullah alive. So this hadith proves that the imam is alive even today because the Quran, the Prophet said they will never separate. As long as the Quran is there, the imam will be there. So you say, no, there's no imam. That means they separated. It also proves that the imam is ma'asum. Because if the imam never separates, the Ahlul Bayt never separate from the Quran, that means they're ma'asum because the Quran is ma'asum. So if someone that's with the Quran never separates from the Quran, is ma'asum. Never goes against the Quran. See how important this hadith is? That sometimes we forget about and we neglect. So through this hadith, we understand that no, the 12th Imam is alive today. Because as long as the Quran is there, there has to be the walking, speaking Quran. Because the Imam is the embodiment of the Quran. Don't we say, Assalamu alaikum ya sharik al Quran? When we do ziyara of the 12th Imam, we say, Ya sharik al Quran. He's the partner of the Quran. Because you cannot have Quran by itself. Quran and the 12th Imam. These two come hand in hand together. So that's why brothers and sisters, you see the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, you see the Quran, you see the world religions, they are all concerned about this Messiah that will come and that will bring peace to this world. Inshallah for the next few nights, I will go over the topic of Imam Al-Mahdi so that we can acquaint ourselves better with our Imam. Some of us, we have no clue who Imam Al-Mahdi is. We just hear Imam Mahdi, Imam Mahdi. Ajallah faraja. Who is Imam Al-Mahdi? What are his traits? When will he reappear? How will he reappear? Who are his companions? What will happen? What are the signs of the reappearance? How can I prepare myself for that day? The life of Imam Al-Mahdi before he went into Ghaybah. Why did the Imam go into Ghaybah? Some of us, we don't know. We have no clue. What's the purpose of an Imam in Ghaybah? These are important points that are very essential to our aqeedah, to our belief system, that I will inshallah go over through the course of these nights. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our amal in this onset of month of Ramadan. I ask Him to give us the tawfiq that we can follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt and we can be true Shia of Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajallallah Farajah Al-Sharif. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our siyam, our qiyam, to answer our Du'as, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all during this beautiful month of Ramadan. Insha'Allah we will end with this du'a that we do for our 12th Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. Everyone together. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abaih. Fi hadhi al-sa'a. وفي كل ساعة 
وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين الفاتحة مع الصلوات